So in this final segment today, we're going to talk about set theory just a little bit because if you're going to take a math class, if you're going to be exposed to math for computer science, it's useful to have at least a glimmering of what the foundations of math looks like, how it starts and how it gets justified, and that's what set theory does. In addition, we will see that um, uh, the diagonal argument that we've already made much of plays a, played a crucial role in the development and understanding of set theory. Um, so let's begin with an issue that plays an important role in set theory uh, and in computer science, having to do with the idea of taking a function and applying it to itself, or, or having something refer to itself. And it, this is one of these things that's notoriously doubtful. There's all these paradoxes about it. Maybe the simplest one is when I uh, assert this statement is false. And the question is, is it true or false? Well, if it's true, then it's false. And if it's false, then it's true, and we get a kind of buzzer. Uh, it's not possible to figure out whether this statement is true or false. I think we would deny that it was a proposition. So that's a hint that there's something suspicious about self-reference and self-application and so on. On the other hand, it's worth remembering that in computer science, we take this for granted. So let's look at an example. Um, here's a simple example of a list in a, a scheme Lisp notation, um, meaning it's a list of three things, 0, 1, and 2. Uh, and the, the black parens indicate that we're thinking of it as an ordered list. Now, the way that I would represent a list like that in memory, typically, is by using these things that are called const cells. So a const cell has these two parts. The left-hand part points to the uh, value in that location in the list. So this first const cell points to 0, which is the first element of the list. The second component of the const cell points to the next element of the list. And so here you see one pointing to the uh, third element of the list, and there you see two, and that little uh, nil marker indicates that's the end of the list. So that's a simple representation of a list of length three with three const cells. Well, one of the things that um, a computer science lets you do and many languages let you do is that you can manipulate these pointers. So using uh, the language of scheme, what I can do is uh, do an operation called set car, where I'm taking, in this case, I'm setting the second element of L, that is this const cell, to L. And set car is saying, let's change what the element in the, uh, 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 in the left hand part of this uh, cell is. This is where the value of the second element is. Let's change the value of the second element to be L. What does that mean as a pointer manipulation? Well, it's pretty simple. I just move this pointer to point to the beginning of the list L. And now I have an interesting situation because this list uh, now is a list that consists of, of uh, 0 and L and 2. It's a list that has itself as a member. And it makes perfect sense. Um, uh, and if you sort of expand it out, L is this list that has begins with 0, and then its second element is a list that begins with 0, um, and the second element of that list is a list that begins with 0, and so on, and then uh, the third element of L is 2, and the third element of the second element of L is 2, and so on. It's an interesting infinite nested structure that's nicely represented by this finite um, uh, circular list. Okay. Um, Let's look at another example where, in computer science, we actually apply things to themselves. So let's define the composition operator. And again, I'm using a notation from the language scheme. I want to take two functions, f and g, that take one argument. And I'm going to define their composition. The way that I compose f and g is I define a new function, h of x, which is going to be the composition of h and g. The way I define h of x is I say, apply g to f to g, uh, apply f to g applied to x and return the value h. So this is a, a compose is a procedure that takes two procedures f and g and returns their composition h. Okay, let's practice. Suppose that I compose the square function that maps x to x squared and the add one function that maps x to x plus one. Well, um, if I 
uh, compose the square of adding one and I apply it to three, what I'm saying is uh, let's add one to three and then square it and I get three plus one squared or 16. Because the add one and then square it is the function that's the comp composition of square and add one. Now I can do the following. I could square. I could compose square with itself. If I take the function square it and square that, I'm really taking the fourth power. So if I apply the function compose of square square to three, I get three squared squared or 81 or three to the fourth. All makes perfect sense. Okay. Well now let's uh, define a, a, a composite with itself operation. I'm going to call it comp2. Comp2 takes one function f and the definition of comp2 is compose f with f. Um, and if I uh, then apply comp2 to square and 3, it's saying, okay, compose square and square. We just did that. That was the fourth power. Apply it to 3, I get 81. And now we can do some weird stuff because suppose that I apply comp2 to comp2 and then apply that to add 1 and apply that to 3. Well, that one's a little hard to follow and I'm going to let you think it through. But comp2 of comp2 is compose something with it four times and when you do that with add 1, what happens is that uh, you're uh, adding 1 four times to 3. If I comp2 of comp2 of square, I'm uh, composing square with itself and then composing that with itself, I'm really squaring four times um, and I wind up with uh, 2 to the fourth or 16 uh, uh, is the power that I'm taking. And so compose 2 of compose 2 of square of 3 is this rather large number, 3 to the 16th. It could be a little bit tricky to think through, but it all makes perfect sense. And it works just fine in recursive programming languages that allow this kind of untyped uh, or generically typed composition. Okay, so why is it that computer scientists are so daring and mathematicians are so timid about self-reference? And the reason is that mathematicians have been traumatized by Bertrand Russell because of Russell's famous paradox, which we're now ready to look at. So um, what Russell was proposing, uh, and it's going to look just like a diagonal argument, is Russell said, let's let W be the collection of sets uh, S such that S is not a member of S. Now let's think about that for a little bit. Most sets are not members of themselves, like um, the set of integers uh, is not a member of itself because the only thing in it, is in it are integers. Um, and the set of the power set of the integers is not a member of itself because every uh, member of the power set of integers is a set of integers, whereas the power set of integers is a set of sets of those things. So those familiar sets are typically not members of themselves. But who knows, maybe there are these weird sets like the, uh, uh, like the circular list or a function that can compose with itself that is a member of itself. Now, let me step back for a moment and, and mention where, where did Russell get thinking about this. And it, it comes from the period in the late 19th century when mathematicians and logicians were trying to think about uh, uh, confirming and establishing the foundations of math. What was math absolutely about? What were the fundamental objects that, uh, that mathematics could be built from? And what were the rules for understanding those ob objects? And it was pretty well agreed that sets were it. You could build everything out of sets and you just need to understand sets and then you were in business. Uh, and there was a German mathematician named Frege uh, who tried to demonstrate this by developing uh, a set theory uh, very carefully, giving careful axioms for what sets were. And he showed how you could build out of sets, you could build the integers, and then you could build rationals, which are sort of just pairs of integers, and then you could build real numbers by taking collections of rationals that, um, uh, that had a least upper bound, and, uh, and then you can keep going and you can build functions and continuous functions. And he showed how you could build up um, the basic structures of mathematical analysis and prove their basic theorems in his formal set theory. The problem was that Russell came along and looked at Frege's set theory 
and came up with the following paradox. He defined W to be the collection of S in sets, such that S is not a member of S. Frege would certainly have said that's a well-defined set, and, and he will acknowledge that W is a set. Um, and let's look at what this means. And I mean, this is a diagonal argument. So let's remember, what's the, by this definition of W, what we have is that a set S is in W if and only if S is not a member of S. OK, that's fine. Then just let S be W. And we immediately get a contradiction that W is in W if and only if W is not in W. Poor Frege, <laughs> his book was a disaster. Math is broken. Um, uh, uh, you can prove that you're the pope. You can prove that pigs fly. Verified programs crash. Math is just broken. Um, it's not reliable. You can prove anything by in Frege's system because it reached a contradiction. And from something false, you can prove anything. Well, Frege, you know, had a book. It was a vanity publication, uh, and the the preface of it had to be rewritten. And he said, "Look." Um, uh, my system's broken, and I know that, and Russell showed that unambiguously, but I think that there's still something here that's salvageable, and so I'm going to publish the book, but I apologize for the fact that you can't rely on the conclusions. Um, poor Frege. Uh, that was his life work gone down the drain. Okay. Um, how do we resolve this? What's wrong with this apparent paradox of Russell's? Well. Um, the assumption was that W was a set. And that turns out to be what we can doubt. So the definition of W is that for all sets W, S is in W if and only if S is not in S. And we got a contradiction by saying, OK, um, substitute W for S. But that's allowed only if you believe that W is a set. Now, it looks like it ought to be because it's certainly well defined by that formula. Uh, but it was well understood at the time that that was the fix to the paradox. You just can't allow W to be a set. Um, the problem was it, that W was acknowledged by everybody to be absolutely clearly defined mathematically. It was this bunch of sets. And yet, we're going to say it's not a set. Well. It's OK, that will fix Russell's paradox. But it leaves us with a much bigger general philosophical question is, when is a well-defined mathematical object a set and when isn't a set? And that's what you need sophisticated rules for. When is it that you're going to define some collection of elements and you can be sure it's a set as opposed to something else called a class, by the way, uh, which is uh, basically something that's too big to be a set because if it was a set, it would be uh, it would contain itself and be circular and self-referential. Well, there's no simple answer to this question about what things are sets and what are not sets. But over uh, time, by the 1930s, people had pretty much settled on an, a very economical and, and persuasive set of axioms for set theory called the zermelo frankel set theory axioms. Um, and uh, ZF was some basic axioms. And then there's an additional axiom called the choice axiom, which basically uh, all mathematicians want because they use it comfortably in their reasoning, um, although uh, it, it is separate from the others. And there's some controversy about whether you absolutely need it because you can get by with an interesting set theory without choice. But ZFC, zermelo frankel with choice, is basically the set theory that all mathematicians use. And, and out of which you can, we believe, uh, safely build math. So what do these axioms look like is they're written in the language of set theory, meaning that it's predicate logic in which the only predicate actually is x is a member of y and x is equal to y. And then you can just combine things with logical connectives. So here would be a basic axiom that explains the relationship between equals and membership. And it's saying it's called extensionality. It says that two sets, y and z, are equal if and only if they have the same elements. Every, if, if everything x that's in y is in z, and that's true if and only if, then that's exactly what um, y equals z means. This implies is actually itself an if and only if, but it seemed confusing to write it that way. So this is the important direction.
Another uh, simple axiom is the existence of the power set. For any set, there is another set which consists of all its subsets. And that's what it looks like. And I'll let you stare at that and figure out that that's what it's saying um, uh, by interrupting this video. But I'm not going to explain it further because I want to go on. It, we're not really going to be looking closely at these ZFC axioms. Um, I just want you to know that they're there and that they seem to do a reasonable job of defining set theory. So how do they avoid the, uh, the problem of what's a set and what's not a set? Well, they give some simple rules for defining new sets. And the rules are that anything that's a subset of a set you have already is going to be OK. Um, but you can't just uh, define stuff cold that's not a subset of anything you've built already. The way you build new stuff is by applying the power set axiom. Um, now, according to ZF, there's another fundamental property of sets, which is how they uh, they fix some of this circular stuff, which is that they won't let sets be them members of themselves. A set has to be simpler. Uh, anything in a set has to be, in a certain sense, simpler than the set itself. Technically, what it means is that a set can't be a member of itself, and it can't even indirectly be a member of itself. It can't be a member of a member of itself, and so on. That's called the foundation axiom. Um, and so no set's a member of itself or a member of a member. And if you do that, you wind up with a set theory that seems to do a pretty good job. Now, one of the consequences of the foundation axiom is that the collection of all sets is not a set. Because other, if it was, it would be a member of itself violating foundation. Okay. Well, since no set is a member of itself, W, which was the collection of sets that were not members of themselves, actually is all sets. And that means that W is not a member of itself, so W is not a set. And that is the final resolution of how the foundation axiom fixes Russell's paradox by, and explains just why it is that W is not a set.